Now my text is uh, in the book of Jude, a very short book uh, so far as time and space is concerned, but a very weighty book. It's a very critical uh, letter in the New Covenant writings. Uh, if you're not familiar with the book of Jude, then I exhort you to become familiar with it because it's very contemporary. It might not sound like it's contemporary, but the Lord will give you understanding of this also. It's a, it's a very, very critical book. And uh, my text uh, particularly comes from verse 21, although I do want to uh, make mention and uh, incorporate several other parts of this letter into my message. Verse 21 of the book of Jude, it reads, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Keep yourselves. Now I have 11 points in this message. <clears throat> Brother Ricky about fell out of the chair last night when I told him that. I guess we could say though that I have 10 observations and then really just one point. And that's exactly, it's just exactly what the text says. I want to exhort you to keep yourselves in the love of God. That's, that's the point of the text. I mean, I could just, you know, bring it to conclusion now. Keep yourselves in the love of God. That, that's the point. I do have some more things to say though, so I'll continue. Now the immediate context of this uh, verse is important. That keeping is not the only exhortation in this text. It's just one of four in these immediate two verses of uh, verses 20 and 21. And there's also more exhortations following, but for my purpose, these two verses, and there's four exhortations, and keeping yourselves in the love of God is the third exhortation. So I want to consider these other four. Verse 20 says, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, and then our text, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now I want to highlight these four areas, building, praying, keeping, and looking. And you're not going to do much keeping until you're building. And you're not going to do much building until you're praying. And, and looking, at, see they all fit together. Amen. And one, one is part of the other. How can you pray and not build? How could you keep and not look? They're, they're, self, they're interdependent on one another. I want to briefly consider them. Building. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith. We have a constant need to be established in our spirits. In our souls, we have to be built up. We all have liabilities. If you didn't know that, see me later. And we all have things that we all wrestle with. We have to be girded up. There has been some eroding in your structure. In your own, in your own person, there's constant eroding, even of the things that you love, of the things that you desire, of the things that you seek after, there's an eroding, not because you want it to erode, but because God's left us in a body in this world. So building up yourselves. Paul, when he was leaving Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, he said, Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. It's able to build you up. It's able to make you strong. It's able to make you stable. Do you, do you desire to be stable? Yes. Have, you ever, have you ever sensed in yourself that you that you're not as stable as you would like to be or as you know that you can be in the Lord, yes. the word of his grace is able to build you up, Amen. to make you strong, to replenish what the course of this world tends to erode from you. The, the word of his grace is able to build it back up and to make you adequate for the road on which the Lord is, is uh, leading you. Colossians chapter 2 says, rooted and built up. He, he couples two different considerations together. Paul goes to the agricultural world and he says, rooted. He goes to the, con, to the construction world and he says, built up. Rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. You know, you can't really see roots, but you see what they do. You can't see the roots of the tree, but you still see the tree when the storm's gone. That's what the roots do. The, tree, the roots stabilize building yourselves up on your most holy faith. Another one in the book of Acts, Judas and, and Silas, says, being prophets also themselves, they exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. I love that. There's three, there's three occurrences of that word right there in Acts chapter 14 and 15. 
And they confirmed the brother. They went traveling through the churches confirming the brethren. Have you ever wrestled with doubt? Doubt is a thief and a robber to your heart. Amen. And because of the, the uh, presence and the danger of doubt, we need to be confirmed, which is kin to being built up. That's why I put it under this. Being confirmed is being built up. What is being confirmed? We need to be confirmed because we, it does not yet appear what we shall be. The wicked one coming along, if he could convince you that your thoughts about being a son of God and being pleasing to God and being a child of God, being acceptable to God, if he could convince you that those thoughts are an imagination, he would convince you of it. He would have you think that you're just living in an imagination. You need to be confirmed. You need to be confirmed because the wicked one would come and steal away the confidence which you have in Christ Jesus. So the first of the four is building up yourselves in the most holy faith. And the second is praying in the Holy Spirit. Now praying, by the way, there is no other prayer except in the Holy Spirit. Jesus, he noticed a Pharisee. He said he prayed thus with himself. <laughs> that wasn't praying in the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Now I want to note that prayer is a posture, not just a speech. That's why it says praying always. See, don't pray without ceasing. Prayer is a posture. Prayer, it, it doesn't mean when you see somebody with their eyes closed and their head bowed that they're praying in the Holy Spirit. Prayer is a posture. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplications for all saints. Did you know that's part of the whole armor of God? That's in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Praying is part of your armor. Stop praying, you become susceptible. And in fact, you become more than susceptible. You will become injured, which the end thereof is death. Jesus spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, which tells me that I have a tendency of fainting. I have a liability of fainting. It is possible for me, not because I want to faint, not because you want to faint, but because, again, we're in this body. We have a liability. God's left us in a place where we have to have him. Amen. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. God re doesn't redeem anybody and send them on their way. God redeems. God brings us to himself so that we would live and move and have our being in him. That men ought always to pray and not to faint. Now, there's a good reason not to faint, because God will avenge his elect. Amen. It might look bad now, brethren, but it's not always going to be that way. Amen. God will avenge. You ought always to pray and not to faint. Paul told the Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. How am I going to do that when I'm driving down the road? <laughs> God will give you grace, even for that. Pray without ceasing. That's the second of the four exhortations, building and then praying. And the third is keeping. We're going to, cons that's, that's my main point, so I'm still in the introduction. I'm going to save that one. Looking is the fourth. Looking, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Do you ever sense within yourselves that you really just don't have what it takes? If you've ever sensed that, you're blessed. Because you don't have what it takes. You've got to look for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is opposed to the proud but he giveth grace unto the humble. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, whatever has our attention at this time, what has your attention right now? That's your master. Amen. For that time, for this moment of time, whatever has your attention is your master. You just, you've just given over the reins to whatever has your attention. Looking for the mercy, where it, the apostle, or Jude, is talking about what has your attention. If your attention is devoted to the mercy of looking for the mercy, then the mercy of God, and God, the God of mercy, I should say, he's your master. Amen. Peter talked about looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. Looking for it. That your attention is drawn toward the day of God. He is coming for them that look for him. He's coming for them. Well, maybe you say, well, it says that all eyes will see him. Yes, all eyes will see him, but he's not coming for all of them. He's coming for them that look for him. Amen. 
And running the race, how are we to run the race? Looking at the scenery? No. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Now what we look at gets into us. Yes. You remember, I, don't, I don't remember, uh, I'm not very well read, and so I, I, remember, I don't remember if I read it or if somebody else told me about it, but one of the old uh, uh, writer, uh, authors, preachers, John Wesley type, I don't remember who it was, but he said, uh, talked about the ear gate and the eye gate. Hmm. Our eyes are a gate. What we look at, it's going to get in us. I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about whatever gets our attention, it will eventually, probably sooner than later, it will get into us. And that's why we have to run looking unto Jesus. Amen. In your prayer time, do you ever pray, Lord, I want you to, to dwell within me more. I want more of the Holy Spirit, more of your Son, more of, of the Father. Look unto Jesus. What has your attention will end up getting into you. Just a couple more on this point of looking. Nevertheless, Peter says, according to his promise, we look for new heavens and a new earth. Now, has his promise made you look? <laughs> so you wouldn't be looking if you didn't know he promised it. How would, would Caleb and Joshua really desire the promised land if they didn't know that God promised it? We, according to his promise, we look Amen. for the new heavens Amen. and the new earth. That's what a promise is meant to do. As parents, you know, we, Barb and I tell Judah that if, if you do this, then you get to do that. That's a promise. That's meant to get his attention. We want Judah to... We want him to really want what we're offering to him. This is what God's doing. God's telling us of his exceeding great and precious promises so that we'll want them. And when you get to the point that you want them, you'll get them. That's why Jesus said, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Because God's looking for people that want what he's offering. That, that's, really, that's really, you know, one of the biggest obstacles in the human race is that sin made us want the wrong thing and salvation makes us want the right thing. Amen. And once our, once our desires come into line with God's desires, that's when things really start to happen. Amen. Paul said our conversation is in heaven from whence we also look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Looking, looking for Him. Now, all of that just to tie it into our text that we won't get much keeping of ourselves done if we're not building, praying, keeping, and looking. They all, they all go together. Amen. Now another observation here is the general tone of Jude's letter is also important with regard to our text. The general why, Paul, why Jude wrote and what he wrote. You got we, we need to know this also. Jude felt it necessary to write about them contending for the faith. Mm -hmm. He said, I would have wrote about the common salvation, but I felt it more needful to write, exhorting you to contend more earnestly for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. This means that they had become slack, they had become disarmed, they were in grave danger of being overthrown. Yes. Jude had a concern for their well-being, for their, for their continuance. He had a concern about it, so he wrote, he says, you need to contend for the faith, and then connect it into our text, and keep yourselves in the love of God. Mm -hmm. See, at the end of a lot of letters, we have like 1 Thessalonians 5, we have a lot of exhortations in, in succinction, one following the other. Uh, the book of Romans does the same thing. It ends with a lot of exhortations. Well, that isn't the writers of Scripture saying, and by the way, do this, 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 and this. That's not, that's not why we have these exhortations. Is because after Jude labored in this letter writing, this is the proper conclusion. Because of the condition of the, of the people to whom he wrote, keep yourselves in the love of God. Here's another matter about the general direction of the book of Jude. Certain men had crept in unawares, bringing in damnable heresies. What a person listens to is of great impact upon their spirit. Amen. And I don't mean whether or not you watch Saturday Night Live. That's not what I'm talking about. Of course, that's bad too, you understand. I'm talking about what you listen to in the name of God. John the Apostle, he says, test every spirit yes. to see whether it be of God. Yes. And certain men had crept in unawares, which means they had an undercover, an undercover uh, plan. They, they had an agenda that they didn't, they didn't post on the billboard in the back. They, came, they crept in unawares. They had damnable heresy. No child of God can lend their ear to swelling words without consequence. Amen. To listen to words a message that comes in the name of God that puffs up 
that says Jesus Christ, that says God the Father, that says salvation, but really is not from God, has nothing to do with Jesus, and is not concerned about your salvation, that's swelling words. It's like a balloon. It's this size, but not without air in it. And so we cannot listen to swelling words without consequence. A message that comes in the name of Christ will either take from you or it will give to you. Amen. It can't be passive. Anything that's connected to Jesus Christ, how can it be passive? Amen. The people were also letting the truth slip out of their mind. Jude says, though you once knew this, I'm going to write it again. He brought the people out of, Israel, or out of Egypt and then he destroyed those that believed not. Why would Jude write like this? Because they were in that danger. That's why they were forgetting. Yes. Spiritual forgetfulness is like a soldier that leaves his armor and weapons back at the camp and marches into the war. Mm -hmm. To forget what God has told us is very dangerous, and they were in danger of forgetting. Amen. Last observation on the general direction of the letter is that those that had infiltrated the church were like clouds without water. What good is that? Yes. A cloud that comes, at the, the sight of a cloud generally promises rain, right? A cloud without water. It comes promising that I can bring refreshment to the face of the earth, but after all, I didn't. Clouds without water. Trees without fruit. Yeah. Fruitless trees. They were also foaming waves of the sea. You know what the, the, foam, the foaming waves of the sea is like gathering all the trash and the muck and the mire and depositing it on the shore. That's what the foaming waves of the sea. It just brings up all the junk and then leaves it for you. You ever felt like that after a sermon? <laughs> they just brought a bunch of junk up. I really didn't want to remember that, but he reminded me of it. That's foaming waves of the sea. And wandering stars. They're like wandering stars. See, Jude here, by the Spirit, is showing the nature of these people. These people that had crept in, they brought this message. He's exposing the nature of what, of what they were doing, not the specifics. The specifics were... With, with less consequence. It's the nature of what, of what they were bringing. They were wandering stars. Now people that have, have uh, understanding of the heavenly host, they can look at the stars. They can see things in the stars. I've seen Brother Bob do it. He says, see, see that? I was like, no, I can't see it. <laughs> but people that understand and have knowledge, they can look and see things in the heavenly bodies that I couldn't see, but these, they're wandering stars. What good are they? Remember a star led the, east, the wise men of the east, led them to Christ? What about a wandering star? They might have ended up down in Ethiopia. Christ wasn't down there. Wandering stars, it's like they give promise of direction, but then they lead you to nowhere. Wandering stars. The agents of the evil one may take a form of godliness, but they will not have the power thereof. So our text, the exhortation of keep yourself in the love of God, is very pertinent to the context and the intention to which Jude wrote, that there is danger. Um, my father and I, having been uh, to Pakistan and back, we noticed that one of, the, one of the essential differences in the churches in Pakistan and the churches in America is that the churches there know that there's danger and the churches here generally don't. And so that's why they're, they're alert. They're, they'll receive somebody that comes from God. You know, not one of us asked us if we were Baptist or not. They were just, they were just glad to hear the word of God. Yes. Another point, another observation. I'm not to my point yet. These are all observations. This means, our text means that to whom the letter was written were in fact in the love of God. Yes. He, when Jude says, keep yourself in the love of God, it's not a far stretch to conclude that they were in the love of God because he said, keep yourselves in love of God. Much like God placed Adam and Eve in the garden, God's placed us in his love. Much like God placed Israel in the land of Canaan, so he's placed us into his love. Now the exhortation comes, keep yourselves there. Don't leave what God brought you to. Jesus prayed about this in John 17. He said, and the love with, wherewith thou hast loved me may, may be in them, and I in them. Jesus, he labored for this. He prayed for this, that the love wherewith God had loved Christ would be in us. And have you, have, do you know of anything that Jesus desired that didn't come to pass? No, his prayers were heard in that he feared. And he prayed that the love that God loved him with would be in us. 
That's why we have the love of God. It's all on account, on account of Christ. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. And nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. See, the exhortation means, look around, you are in the love of God. You know, a lot, a big part of growing up into Christ Jesus is just looking around and seeing where God brought you. Amen. <laughs> you've been in heavenly places and you've been, you've been in the light. You've been in the love of God. You've, been, you've come to Mount Zion, but you didn't know it at first, did you? You knew it was good. You, you were thankful, but growing up into him, you look around and there's a lot of things to see and there's a lot of things to hear. There's a lot of things to drink. There's a lot of things to eat. He's, he's brought us to a good place. So I bid you to look around. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This is the last verse of 2 Corinthians. But whosoever keepeth this word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. It's in him. You see, Jude knew. He knew that the people were in the love of God. Maybe, maybe they didn't. Maybe they'd become dull to it. But this is like a heralding. Keep yourself in the love of... He didn't say get yourself in the love of God. He didn't say put yourself back in the love of God. He said keep yourself in the love of God. You know something I love about the scriptures is that God can say exactly what he wants, exactly how he wants to say it. Amen. I mean, I've said a lot of things that I wish he didn't say, and I've said a lot of things that I wish I could have said different, but God's not like that. God can say exactly what he wants to say with the exact intention to which he to which he meant it. I love that. Now another observation is that we should conclude that there are boundaries to his love because he said, keep yourself in it. Amen. Keep yourself in it. Now you can consult the previous message uh, that Brother Mike brought to us. Those are the boundaries. That's what Brother Mike was speaking about. There are boundaries to his love. Another observation is that we have an enemy that would, having his way, draw us out away from the love of God. He said, keep yourself in the love of God, so this is a flag that there's danger. Because he said, keep. You're going to have to put some efforts out here because there's danger. There are things, there are influences, personalities, messages, sights, sounds, entertainments. However they come, they're all enemies if they move you away from the love of God. Amen. It says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Mm -hmm. Paul the Apostle said that when he was writing to the Corinthians in the second letter. He was giving some instructions about a bad condition. He says, this is what you need to do because we're not ignorant of his devices. Paul, when he heard about the Corinthians, he could identify, he could say, this is an opportunity for the wicked one. Yeah. Paul wasn't ignorant of his devices. He knew that if this condition persisted, he knew that it was going to lead them away. He knew that it was going to eat like cancer. He knew because he wasn't ignorant of his devices. It's like, here, here's the situation that God's left us in, brethren. God's purposed what he was going to do, and then he told us. He didn't just make a purpose. He told us what his purpose was. And then he, he, he let loose the, the, the wicked one, which actually Satan works for God. You do know that, don't you? Amen. That he's, he's under his dominion. He is, he's Lord of all, and that includes the devil. So after making the purpose, he told us of the purpose, and then the wicked one, he, he showed, he, like he told us all his secrets. You, you go back and read in the book of Genesis and all the temptations in the garden. You go read in Matthew chapter 4, the temptations that he gave to Jesus in the wilderness. The devil just shows all his true colors. We're not ignorant of his devices. If we, op if we open our ears and we go learn what this meaneth, then we won't be ignorant of his devices. So when he, when he comes, <laughs> you can say, you have no part in me. Another observation is that we have a fallen nature, the old man, or called the flesh, that's a constant liability to the children of God that are yet in this body. We have such exhortations to keep yourself in the love of God because we're toting about these liabilities. When was the last time you got away from your body? <laughs> you can't just run it. You know, a lot, of, a lot of dangers, we can just run and hide. That's why Jesus talked about a prayer closet. You go in your closet and you shut yourself out of a lot of distractions than if you go drive down range line while you're praying. You go to the closet, but you can't get away from your body. There's, there's coming a day when you will get away from your body. Amen. You will. 
the redemption of our body. But in, but in this we do groan. Why? Because my body has never prompted me to seek those things which are above. Amen. It never has, and in fact it never will. Amen. God told me about this body. He says, they that are not flesh cannot please God. Now, of course, that, that word flesh doesn't just mean body. That Romans chapter 8 text means fleshly nature, the nature that is at home in this body. So we have this exhortation to keep yourself in the love of God because we're in, we're in an environment of liabilities. We're in an environment of dangers. Woe unto them that are at ease in Zion. Woe unto them. They, they will suffer loss. At best, they will suffer loss. Have you ever read the uh, John Bunyan work, uh, Pilgrim's Progress? If you haven't read it, I'll give you an assignment to buy it next week and read it by the end of next week. Because it's, it's, it is very good. Well, Christian, in his journey, he was traveling up the hill. He'd already gotten rid of his burden, which is the sin. He'd already gotten rid of it. And the, the, another man had already given him a scroll, which was the truth. It was the scriptural writings given it to him. And he, he became weary, and he sat down, and he slept. And you know what happened is he lost his scroll. And it rolled back down the hill. He woke up with great sorrow, realizing that he had slept, realizing that the time that he had slept, he could have spent journeying farther down the road. And then to add bad upon worse, he lost his scroll. He had to go back. He had to, he had to, he had to tread the path that he'd already trod two more times. He lost his scroll. We've got to know that we have liabilities. If you, if you go to sleep, you'll lose something. That's just, that's just the truth of the matter. There's another observation. In this text, God has given us all responsibilities in this great salvation. Actually, I shouldn't say responsibilities. I should say stewardship. He's given us a labor in this great work that he is doing. God's not going to save anybody that's unwilling to work together with him. Nobody comes into glory kicking and screaming. God isn't going to drag anybody in Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. That's actually one of the evidences of a new heart. Willing. Amen. What would you have me to do? They're willing. I mean, isn't it a great liberty? <laughs> Amen. I, remember, I remember the time. I mean, not just one, you know, just bang. I didn't have a Damascus Road. Some of you did. But I didn't have a Damascus Road conversion. I had, uh, I had more of a Road to Emmaus conversion. Where the Lord came to my side and opened the scriptures to me. And then after a while, I realized what happened. <clears throat> but it's a great liberty to have a heart that's going in the same direction that the purpose of God is. Amen. God's given us some responsibility. He's given us some, some uh, stewardship in this great salvation. God's not creating a generation in Christ like Nebuchadnezzar. God's not making people serve him. God's not making people go to heaven. He said, whosoever will may come. Whosoever will. Remember, uh, Brother Given mentioned last night the, uh, the parable of the wedding feast. Go and invite those that were bidden. They, they made excuses. Well, the, they, didn't, they didn't make them come. Didn't make them come. They just left out. They, went th they, they got those that wanted to come. Amen. If you want to come, you can. Amen. If you don't want to come, you can't. Amen. So the idea of the gospel is to give you hunger. It's to give you a thirst. I've heard it said you can't. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink, yes. But you can lead him to the salt, salt block first. Then you can lead him to the water, and he'll probably drink. And you know the law is like the salt block. The law is a schoolmaster. I wasn't going to preach this, but just quickly. Uh, Galatians chapter 3. The law is our schoolmaster, taskmaster. New, New, New American Standard says taskmaster. King James Version says schoolmaster. But the idea is that the, lesson, the law is a lesson to teach. And it doesn't have any mercy. And the law comes along, and here's the, here's the principle. Here, you know you're a graduate from the law when you know you're a sinner. That's, that's the lesson that the law has. It comes along to teach you that you're a sinner. Once you know you're a sinner, it cha completely changes the sound of the gospel. Who needs a Savior that's not a sinner? If you're a sinner, you need a Savior. So go to the law, and you get your diploma from the law, and then, the, then, then you get... Then you get faith. It says that we're, that we're all children of God by faith, which is in Christ Jesus. I love that truth. <clears throat> I will guide you with mine eye, the Lord said. 
I'll guide you with my eye. God's given us responsibility. He says, I'm going to guide you with my eye. In other words, go the direction that I'm looking. Go that direction. You know, people that know each other real well, I can communicate with my wife a lot more effectively than somebody that I just, that I don't know. I mean, my wife, she can, she can tell things. Uh, she can tell, she can, I can communicate with her when I didn't even know I was communicating. <clears throat> And that will be enough on that point. <laughs> but here's some, of the, uh, here's some of the responsibilities. that See, God's given us a stewardship. Keep yourself in the love of God. When Jesus healed the man with a withered hand, he said, stretch it out. <laughs> he gave him something to do. Stretch forth your hand. You want, do you want a stronger hunger for the word of God? Get in the word of God. Amen. That's where you find it. The lame man, Jesus said, take up your bed and walk. Now, how unreasonable is that? He's lame. Jesus said, take up your bed and walk. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. That wasn't very nice. He could have at least took him. He was blind. He's a blind man. <laughs> that wasn't in my notes. <clears throat> he said, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. He was blind. I don't know where the pool of Siloam was with regard to their, where they were. But the point was that God, Jesus had something to give him, but he told him something to do to get it. Amen. Let down your nets on the right side of the boat. But Lord, we've been fishing all night, and after all, we're the fishermen, you're not. Jesus said, let your nets down on the right side of the boat. The Lord will let you fish all night and get nothing. The Lord will let you come to the end of your rope. Yes. That's just the way of the Lord. That's the way he works. Amen. The Lord let the valley of dry bones, he let him get very dry. Then he brought him to life. Amen. Let down your nets on the right side of the boat. He said, how many loaves have you? Go and see. You ever come to the Lord and feel like he told you that? You come to the Lord and say, I'm dry. I'm empty. I don't have anything. Maybe the Lord's telling you, go see how many loaves you have. <laughs> mm -hmm. Don't forget what the Lord's already given to you. Jesus said, occupy till I come. I'm leaving and it's better for you that I go away. I've heard people say, I really wish I, if I could have just seen the miracles, it'd be a lot, I'd be a lot better of a Christian. No, you wouldn't. The people that saw his miracles are the one that killed him. Amen. Amen. Occupy till I come. It's better for us that he go away. And he gave us something to do. Watch and pray that you fall not into temptation. Now, there's two ways to read that. Watch and pray. Pray that you won't enter into temptation. Lord, lead us not into temptation. That's one way. Another way is, while you're watching and praying, you're not very likely to fall into temptation. You know we fight the good fight of faith indirectly? If you're going to stop a truck, don't get in front of it. Amen. You can stop the truck from the side a lot easier if you have the right tools to stop the truck. We fight the good fight of faith indirectly. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. See, we actually resist the devil by getting out of his domain. He can, he can only work in this world, but praise God, he's raised us up to sit in heavenly places and Satan can't go there. Amen. Watch and pray that you, you see how this works. God's given us something to do, but then he's provided all the, all the materials, all the resources to do it, all the reasons to do it. God's not a hard taskmaster. He's not. We have a, we have a high priest that can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He didn't put a period there. It says, for it's God that is at work in you, both the will and to do of his good pleasure. Amen. See, all of our work, we're laboring together with him. Amen. All of it. It, 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 wouldn't, it wouldn't really matter if we, uh, if we had a lot of good knowledge and a lot of good intentions, a lot of good disciplines, a lot of, a lot of time on our hands, if we were working or laboring without God. We're working together with God. That's when something gets done. Jesus said, go and learn what this meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. See, Jesus gave him something to do. He says, go and learn it. The best lesson learned is the one learned in the fire. Amen. It really is. I've learned this on my job, that the best, just to make a crude parallel here, I told my boss not so long ago, the best lesson I've learned is at midnight, trying to get a job done in the attic by myself, that's the best lesson that I've learned. Now, there's a parallel to that. I'm not just bragging about my job. There's a parallel that when it, when it almost brings me to tears and then I learn it, I'm not going to forget it. 
And God has a way of working like that. God has a way of doing it. Remember, he, he taught uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus that. He says, I'll, I'm not going to go now. Lazarus died. He says, I'm not going now. He stayed another day. Or was it two? And then he went on the fourth day, and he told one of his sisters, your brother will live again. And they said, we know that he'll rise again at the, at the last day, at the, at the resurrection. And the, the sister, remember if it was Mary or Martha, but she said, Lord, I know that even now, yes. even now, what, whatever you ask of God, he'll give it to you. You see, if, if you've got something that you're enduring, you might be in the fourth day. Yes. You might be in the fourth day and the Lord's coming to you right now. Amen. And the, the point is that he's let you run to the end of your rope so you realize you've got to have him. And then when salvation, when hope when the hope, hope, see, what, what is it? Solomon said, hope deferred maketh the heart sick. But when the desire comes, it's a tree of life. And the Lord might wait four days. I love that point. Here's another observation about our text back in Jude. <clears throat> there are some doctrinal extremes in this area of keeping yourself in the love of God. And here's what I mean. Some say it's not possible to be put out of the love of God once you're in it. And then the other extreme is, is that... There's really not much said about it except they're wrong, but um, the point is that you can fall away. How about that? This church signs are so ridiculous these days anyways, they ought to just put it on the church sign. It is possible to fall away. I mean, th this, is what they, this is what they say. <clears throat> uh, salvation is not performance dependent. Not on our performance. Right. It's dependent on his performance. I like Brother Kenny. He says, I'm saved by works. <laughs> his works. <clears throat> now the former, those that say it's impossible to be out of the love of God, once saved, always saved. You've heard it, okay? Eternal security. I'll just say it. There it is. They quote Romans 8, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing. To which I say, amen. Then they go back to, to Genesis and they say, and the Lord shut him in, in the ark. They forgot he built the ark. But the Lord shut him in. See, eternal security. Well, the, the latter, they really don't have any Bible text to support their... They don't, really, they don't really have any Bible text that they herald, like Romans 8 or, or Genesis, but they just say the Baptists are wrong. That's really all they say. But here, here's, what I, here's the point that I want to make on this. The doctrinal extremes. Some say you can get out if you want. That doesn't sound like gospel to me. I don't want out. And then the other extreme... It says you can't get out even if you want out. Now here's the extremes, but here's the point that I wanted to make about those extremes. I don't think it's as easy to get out of the kingdom of God as some people would have us think. Amen. It's not. He's caused us to be born of an eternal seed. Here's some of the reasons that I want to uh, give you. God's the one that went on the initiative to save us. Salvation's God's idea, not ours. God's the one that went on the initiative to save us. So after seeking and saving that which was lost, do you think he'll say, okay, there you go, you can leave? Do you think, he's, do you think God's going to do that? Do you think God's just going to say, okay, I know you really don't want it? No, he bears long with us. He does. You remember the sheep that he went after, the one he left the 90 and 9? He went after the one sheep. He left the fold. The one sheep left the fold. You remember? Amen. It wasn't like Jesus saying, okay, I've got 99 now. I'm going to go find another one. That one had left the fold. He went into the wilderness and found it. When he found it, he rejoiced, put it on his shoulders, took it home. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Jesus came into the world to seek and save that which was lost. God invested his own son in salvation. God invested his own right arm. God sent his own Holy Spirit. He commissions his own holy angels to minister. All that to bring him to himself. God's bringing us to himself after making this tremendous eternal investment in this whole, in this, this whole uh, salvation. Do you think God's going to just let us go at a drop of a hat? Because I'm hard hearted. Because... Because I have turned the back and not the face, and we all have. You think God's just going to let us go at the drop of a hat? No. He won't do it. 
The spirit that he's caused to dwell within us lusteth to envy. Yes. And that means salvation to us, brethren. Yes. So keeping ourselves in the love of God, see, God's laboring too to keep us in his love. Yes. Here's another point. <clears throat> keeping ourselves in the love of God cannot be done under law or by a code of obligations. God hasn't just laid down the law, you better keep yourself in my love or else. Now, some people have to be saved with fear. And so that, that might be, at times, that might be good to divide the word like this, that God's, God destroyed them which believe not. Sometimes it's good to divide the word like that. But when it comes down to the very essence of this, it can't be done just because you have to. It can't. Amen. We have to be jealous to be in the love of God. We have to want to be in the love of God. We have to want the things of God more than anything else, or else they will be out of our reach. Amen. God doesn't allow a person that has no hunger and thirst for righteousness to just walk down the street and pick up the truth. God doesn't allow it. Something that's very precious to you, uh, Brother Al said one time at our fellowship, he said, our, our gatherings together is like a showing of the family jewels. That's good. I put that in my bag. <laughs> I remembered that statement. But see, family jewels, that's, you don't just show that to anybody. There's things that you have, things that you know, things that you hide in your heart. You can't just show it to anybody. They might turn again and rend you. You can't just show them to anybody. That's the way the truth is. God's not just going to show it to anybody. God shows it. God gives the truth to people that love it, to people that will cherish it, to people that keep it. We've got to hasten on <clears throat> People that are jealous to stay in the love of God. David said, one thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after. That might be called narrow-mindedness. I call that godly. Amen. One thing Amen. I'll seek after. it. Paul said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Jacob said, I won't let you go till you bless me. Amen. See, they were jealous for the things of God. Mm -hmm. Moses said, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. Mary hath chosen that good part, and it will not be taken from her. Amen. The woman said, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. Mm -hmm. She'd been ill for 12 years. She pressed through the crowd to touch Christ. She was jealous for what he had. Mm -hmm. that's, what we have to, that's what we have to have in order to stay in the love of God. Keep yourself in the love of God. See, the world's vying for our attention. The world's vying for our, our affection. The world's vying for our devotion. So is God. See, this world, to get high enough, this world really is just like a stage of competition. And there's really only two competitors, God and the wicked one. And they're, com they're competing for the hearts of men. The blind man said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the people walking with him told him, be quiet. He said, stop yelling at him like that. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The blind man saw an opportunity, and he wasn't going to let it pass. He kept crying out. People told him to be quiet. He kept crying out. He got what he came for. Amen. That's seeking you shall find. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. That's what we have to have to keep ourselves in the love of God, is a violence to take the kingdom and to stay in the love of God. Somebody told me the other day, he was a preacher, he says, if, if the people can hear it and see it and write it, then they'll remember it. He's talking about a sermon. You see the video projector on the ceiling here. They, they put sermons on the laptops and show the notes. That's fine. I have nothing against that. I have, a, I have something against the philosophy of that. That if I, if I require that the people hear it when I say it, see it when I put it up there, and then tell you to write notes like an eighth grader, or otherwise you'll forget it. Write this down now. If I think that's required before, you're, before you'll remember it, or otherwise you're going to forget, like who invited the psychologist into the church? That's psychology. Amen. Here, I, I, uh, I didn't think of this when, the, when he told me, but I'll, I'll, have, to, I'll have to tell him this uh, next time I see him, that here's another... Resolution to people remembering what you say, that they love it. When they love it, they'll remember it. You don't, have, you don't have to tell me to do some things that I love. You don't have to tell me to do it. I love doing it. You don't have to tell me to think about this 
this certain thing because I love it. Amen. Brother Given doesn't call me every Saturday morning and say, don't forget, you're preaching tomorrow. He didn't have to do that. There was probably a time when it would have been good if he had done that. <laughs> Here's another observation. That this exhortation, keeping yourselves in the love of God, it strikes on the very essence of the good fight of faith. This is, this is the good fight of faith, to stay where God put me. Keep yourself in the love of God. The good fight of faith. See, the flesh, I kind of like this point. <clears throat> the flesh has a one-track mind with three rails. One track, three rails. It's going downward, and the three rails are the lust of the flesh, the lust of the mind, and the pride of life. Three rails, one track, they're going down. The good fight of faith is taking all the steam out of the flesh so it can't go down the track. That's the good fight of faith. It's just, not, it's just saying no to the flesh. I mean, I, I know I'm simplifying that, but it's just no. The flesh makes its suggestion. It might just make a suggestion at first. I, I'd like to do that. You say, no. And then it'll, it'll say, we need to do this. You say, no. And then it'll say, you're going to do this. You just say, no. And then it'll get to a point where it say, we're going to do this. The flesh, it gets like that. And you just say, no. That's the good fight of faith. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Another observation is that the love of God is more of a place than a response. God's not responding to how, what a good bunch of people we are. God's love is not, oh, I'm going to love those people. Look at what they did and look at who they are. Look at what they're doing. The love of God is more of a place where we've come rather than a response from God. And here's, here's how I'm going to make that point. <clears throat> the Lord directs your hearts into the love of God. See, it's more of, it's more of a place that we have come. Here, in, in quick succession, Adam and Eve were in the garden. Because they were in the garden, they got to eat of the fruit. Those that were in Gideon's army won the, the battle because they were in Gideon's army. Those that were in Israel's camp, they got manna because they were in the camp. Those that were in the tabernacle could smell the incense because they were in the tabernacle. Those that were in Solomon's house got to eat at this enormous, abundant provision of a table because they were in Solomon's house. That's why. See, it's a place. The love of God is a, is a place. If you were in the upper room, you heard Jesus talk about going away because you were in the upper room. If you were on the mount, you saw Jesus transfigured because you were on the mount. If you're in the light, you can see the truth. If you're in the kingdom, you get all the benefits of the kingdom. If you're in the spirit, you have life and peace. When you're standing in grace, righteousness will reign. If you're walking by faith, you'll overcome the world. All these things to say, if you're in Christ, you're in God's love. Amen. See, the love of God is more of a place to where we've come. To where, rather, to where God has brought us. Now, keeping, here's, here's really the point. Here's the point of my sermon. Keeping yourself in the love of God. <clears throat> Legion is the name of the distractions that are in this world. The world never runs short of things that would draw us away. It has an, it has an endless supply. This is the intention of the wicked one. When he went to make war with the remnant of her seed, he went to make war to take them out of God's favor. That's, that's his intention toward us. Keep yourself in the love of God. I'm just going to give you these, these scriptures in uh, succession uh, to close these considerations. Jesus prayed, I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, his people. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thy name those whom thou hast given me. When we labor to keep ourselves in the love of God, we find that we're not the only one laboring to do it. God's laboring, to, we're laboring together with Him. The work's already been going on and we enter into God's labor. Amen. Jesus prayed again, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from evil. Amen. Jesus prayed this to God. Now do you think that God is able to do what He's promised? He's able to keep you. The peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the father and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Unspotted. 
You want to you live such a life before God that when the world gets on you, you're uncomfortable. The world, the spot of the world, makes you feel bad. That's what Peter talked about when he said, they that suffer in the flesh have ceased from sin. That's what it's talking about. When sin makes you suffer, you will cease from sin. Keep himself unspotted from the world. Clean over Jordan. That's what that's talking about. We know that whatsoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. He can touch part of us, but not every part. Remember Jesus said in the garden, he says the wicked one comes, he says he has no place in me. Now he does have a place in us, but not in all of us. Now, see, we're, we're complex. We have spirit, soul, and body. We have old and new both within us. He can touch the old. He can't touch the new. He can't do it. That's, that's the wicked one toucheth him not. Just a couple more and I'll be done. Behold, I come as a thief, Jesus says, blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments. Keep a hold of what God gave you. Don't let it go. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. And lastly, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, Samuel's mother Hannah, uh, brother, brother Al mentioned this prayer in 1 Thessalonians, or 1 Thessalonians, 1 Samuel chapter 2, and Hannah prayed, he will keep the feet of his saints. Amen. He will keep the feet of his saints. God has brought us a long ways, brethren. And God's got a lot farther to bring us. God's intent on keeping our feet. And I exhort you and exhorting myself also in this exhortation to be just as zealous and as jealous and as determined as God is to keep us. We want to be just that jealous to keep ourselves.